Hello and welcome to the next history podcast which is on society 1964 to 1979. First up, demographic change. There was a continued influx of immigrants into the country from the new commonwealth, increasingly from Pakistan and India. There is also an acceleration of the shift to the new housing developments and council estates in the suburbs and this became more apparent in the late 60s and 70s. There was an increase in the building of roads and the use of cars and this continued to uh, fragment communities which used to stay together in the same community. Now they were able to travel further afield. The increase of population from 1951 to 75 was from 50 million to 56 million, so it increased by 6 million. But this wasn't a steady increase. It rose and it fell and it fluctuated. Between 1975 and 78, the population began to fall because of the um, economic downfall of the country. So let's have a look at the swing in the 60s. The change in attitudes had started in the 50s, but it was more noticeable in the 60s. There was more respect for women and young people at least middle class and educated uh, young people and women. There is a more open society concerned with individual freedom. For example, sexual liberation, fashion, rock music, although this started in the 50s as well, and television were all symptoms and most of them causes as well of the uh, swing in 60s. There was social reform by the Labour Party, already discussed in another podcast, and this is mainly under Jenkins, the Abortion Act, and Sexual Offences Act in 1967, the Theatres Act in 68, and the abolition of the death penalty and the Divorce Reform Act in 1969. There was a backlash by the older and social conservatives uh, who named this the Permissive Society. So it was a time of the generation gap between the old and the young, ones who'd fought in World War II and lived through it, and ones who hadn't. This is a time of protest power. For example, the anti-Vietnam War protests outside the US Embassy in Grosvenor Square in 1968. There was a new concern with civil rights, mirroring the more famous one over black civil rights in America. There were technological advances and the advent of colour television. And all in all, it was a reaction against the boring affluence of the 1950s. However, it wasn't all changed, there was a lot of continuity. Women's rights have been changing ever since World War One and the suffragettes. It only happened this thing in the 60s to educated middle class people and it was more key in London than out in the provinces and the countryside. And the permissive age didn't last. Thatcher returned in 1979 with a political style that was socially conservative, more akin to the one you'd find in the 1950s. Let's have a look in more detail at immigration. They came from the new Commonwealth countries in increasing numbers, despite Commonwealth Immigration Acts in 62 and the Conservatives, and 68 under Labour. Race Relations Acts and the Race Relations Board were set up to deal with racism resulting from immigration in 1965. In 1968, Kenyan Asians, up to a thousand a month at one point, prompt coming into the country, prompted the 1968 Commonwealth Immigration Act. Ironically, this actually sped the immigration up because they wanted to get in before it came into force. And this also led to the Rivers of Blood speech from Enoch Powell, for which he was sacked. Powell's speech seemed to get a lot of support though. There were strikes by dockers and meat porters in London, and a march to Downing Street to defend Powell. One poll showed that 75% supported what he had said. And if you don't know what he said, Google it. When Heath came to power, his government introduced a new immigration act in 1971. In 1970, boat people from Vietnam started arriving. In 1972, Idi Amin expelled the Ugandan Asians, and Heath allowed 28,000 of them, out of roughly 50,000, to come here, when the limit under the 1968 Commonwealth Immigration Act was merely 3,000. There was a sudden rush of Bangladeshis after their breakaway from Pakistan coming to this country, and the concentration of Asians was, and other immigrants, were tended to be in certain areas and in certain cities. London and Leicester, for example. Now, Britain both needed the economic contribution of these refugees and could cope with the social consequences of their assimilation, despite lots of anxieties to the contrary. In 1976, the Race Relations Act of that year made discrimination unlawful in lots of places, including the workplace. 
And Murphy says, the greatest example of their assimilation is the amount of food that we eat from these countries. Everybody loves a curry. Let's move on now to environmentalism. The late 50s and early 60s was CND's time. It was the forerunner of direct action and extra party pressure groups. But CND transformed into a more wider ranging, ranging environmentalism movement that was more about the state of the planet than just against nuclear war. From this came Friends of the Earth, the Green Party, Greenpeace, all which were founded and found their way to Britain in the late 60s and early 70s. Direct action, whether to actually get involved or merely just campaign peacefully, split these groups. The Animal Liberation Front, for example, adopted violent means such as sending letter bombs to politicians. There's also the social impact of the industrial disputes in this time. By the 70s, the nature of these disputes began to change. The beer and sandwiches approach, neg negotiations and bargaining, used to be the order of the day. Now it was more government direct involvement in disputes and more wildcat strikes. More and more days were lost to strikes, which are now more to do with long-term industrial change or uncertainty than they were about short-term pay or working conditions disputes, although not necessarily exclusively that. The disputes caused a polarisation of society. The working class felt their way of life was under siege, and the rest of society started to lose respect for the unions through the three-day working week and fuel rationing, etc. in the early 70s. The three-day week in 1974 strengthened union militancy, but it also strengthened the public reaction against it. Some people did have fun in the dark, I suppose. It's an exciting time, a different time, but also bloody annoying. Moving on to education. The Open University was set up in 1969, originally called the University of the Air, and this was to enable people unable to go to university to study for degrees. It was a huge success. There were 22 new universities in the 60s, 30 polytechnics to supplement them, and this was to emulate the German model of technical and industrial colleges. Many students in this period were the first in their family to go to the universities, and this had an effect on social issues like drugs and sexual freedoms, and feminism. In secondary education, the 60s was the decade of the comprehensive school, moving away from grammar and secondary modern. The IQ tests that were the 11 plus was based on were found to be not reliable, and many children were at the wrong type of school. Plus, comprehensives and their size and scale and co-ed education would mean savings. Now this accelerated under Labour, but when Crossland took over in 1964, the moves towards comprehensives were well underway. Now he requested, not ordered, education authorities to go comprehensive by sending out the Directive 1065, which made government money dependent on going comprehensive. When Thatcher became Education Secretary in 1970, Directive 1065 was withdrawn, but she only rejected 326 applications to go comprehensive out of over 3,000 and more comprehensives became that under Thatcher than any other education secretary. Both Crossland and Thatcher were high spending, but the spending stopped after the oil price rise destroyed the economy in 1973. Historical interpretation. Lynch says, sitting in candlelight and unable to cook, listen to the radio or watch television. Most people were well disposed to neither the miners nor the government. Arthur Marwick, the expert on the 60s, the swinging 60s, claims that they were both structural, for example welfare state and affluence, and ideological changes, attitudes to women and equality for example. Rowe suggests that Labour won in 1964 because they were more in tune with radical social and cultural changes. He also says the Profumo affair reflects revolutionary new attitude to sexual behaviour. Rowe says advertising in colour on TV had made a big impact on accelerating the consumer society. Derek Murphy says the 1962 Immigration Act was clearly racist, allowing white commonwealth people to come in but not black in as many numbers. Murphy says the position of the Labour government elected in 1964 was in practice little different to their conservative predecessors. Politicians are split between the anti-racism of the political classes and the concerns of Labour's working class supporters. Wilson himself said comprehensives will offer a grammar school education for all and Marr says this is clearly a ridiculous suggestion. Marr also says David Seal was put up to it, the abortion act, that is, by Roy Jenkins and that Jenkins did not lead the charge of social reform because the opposition to social reform of the cabinet, including Wilson, um, so therefore he chose and supported backbenchers to lead these um, bills, which allowed him to speak freely on the issues and also allowed the cabinet to vote against them. That's it, thank you very much.